Hi Benoît, it's so nice to see you again. Hi Guy, ça va Guy? Bonjour. Bonjour. Uh, you know, we had the pleasure to uh, have a video with Benoît where we could uh, look at the career of Benoît, which is quite uh, interesting and extraordinary. And, uh, you know, uh, really uh, shows, uh, uh, you know, his uh, journey uh, you know, through the different aspects of information security. So uh, we'll, we'll put the uh, video in, in the show notes. So I, I really recommend you to have a look at it. It is, it is quite interesting. But, uh, of course, the focus today is uh, an interesting one because, uh, as uh, you know, as you may have, might have found out from the first video, uh, Benoit is working for the Information Security Forum in London, which is like a think tank. So while all of us are working for you know our own company or customers and so on, uh, the the you know being in a think tank is in some ways looking at the whole industry and looking ahead of the, the industry in sometimes. So uh, we we are quite privileged to have probably a deeper insight and, and a longer view in the future. So uh, I'm looking forward to our to our discussion here, and uh, we the topic we we have chosen to to present to you because it's it's quite foundational in some senses. So there these days in the old days, when I started the security, there were only UK standards. I remember BS seven 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 nine nine, which was predecessor of ISO twenty seven zero one. And it showed already that the UK was a bit ahead of the curve uh, versus other countries in the world and in Europe in particular. And uh, so uh, and then ISO came and then that was the only thing for a long time. And then later on, more, more, more standards came and we were going to talk about those. And in, in, uh, in the last few months, at least in Europe, we have seen uh, uh, DORA for the uh, uh, regulation for the financial financial sector appearing and becoming uh, very strong, with, which is a regulation with implementation deadlines. And also uh, NIS2, which is a successor of NIS1, uh, mainly with mandatory requirements for critical infrastructure and for important services uh, in companies in, in the country. So uh, a lot of movement uh, in recent days. And uh, so, you know, that means if I'm today an average company, let's say, I have, uh, you know, a lot more uh, options than in the early days of the BS7799, only one standard. Yeah? You are one of the, f the few ones who have actually spent a serious amount of time comparing uh, these different standards. And, and hopefully we, we, can, we, can, we can gain uh, insights from you in, in this uh, video. So uh, where, where, where should I start? Many people say, okay, why don't you take ISO 2701? Because maybe it has been there for a long time. Maybe it is because it can be certified. You can make marketing promotion about it and so on. Other people say, yeah, but you know, it's, it's a lot of documentation, but not enough controls and so on. So that's just to get our discussion going and then looking at, uh, you know, different ways to, to either organize or to focus on different aspects of, uh, of security. So where would you guide us? Where do we start? Thank you, Guy, and uh, appreciate again meeting with you to, to follow up on the discussion interesting topic of international standards for information security. Uh, like you said, I work heavily, I'm heavily involved in, in this. Let's start also thinking about who, who you are, what, what kind of company you are. You're, you're a startup or you're a medium-sized business and you're trying to think about security, which is great. Probably not going direct straight into ISO either. If, you, if you're in that sort of sphere, yeah, you're, you're kind of medium-sized, uh, smallish, small to medium sized business, you started, you want to do good things, you want to do good security. You can look at what ISO does, what ISO provides as uh, a list of controls, but uh, something a bit more to the point, actually, I guess. You want something that's very actionable, you want to do something that is easy to understand, of course. Uh, and there are um, there are different schemes there again, yeah? Uh, in the UK, you mentioned the UK with their, their BS uh, standards initiatives. Uh, they've gathered the pace in the UK. So we've got something very interesting called the UK Cyber Essentials. It's quite simple, uh, but it has this merit of being very simple, very easy to, to comprehend, to understand, to start. You start with 10 high-level controls, uh, and you've got things like, uh, you know, you have to have your firewall in place in order, you have to have your access controls in place. Uh, for us, for people like me who live and breathe into this it's, it's easy to say where are the important uh, spots yeah and and um, but but there are lots of resources out there 
uh, that can help you with a, a sort of short, uh, quick and easy view. Uh, the next one, I could uh, mention something like the CIS controls, uh, CIS 18 controls now, which again is a starting point. Yeah, so you can look at this list and this is really, really useful list, uh, 18 high level controls. And then you can again dive a little bit deeper. And uh, that's probably another one. And yes, and of course, um, for someone like like say, like me, and I would know, I would be able to guide uh, anyone to say, where do you need to start? You need to start with access controls, with network security, into a bit of encryption here and there, but I won't go into all the details right now. Yeah? <laughs> but, but, you know, there, there are these, uh, these, these basics, really, these basics of security. Uh, I, would like to, I would like to comment here that, uh... Uh, you know, to, it's a merit of the U. I mean, I'm happy that at least in Europe, the UK has taken the lead on this because, you know, Cyber Central is really the best starting point if you are not a very big company in some sense. And I think, you know, more, more companies in Europe or maybe Cyber Central has to become more popular, but certainly more companies could or countries could uh, follow the lead because you create an entry point, which is already very good, but it's not so heavy handed than uh, other things. And it focuses on the essentials. Right? It's called cyber essentials, uh, not just on a very broad implementation of uh, cybersecurity. But so I'm going for cyber uh, essentials. Are there different levels of cyber essentials or is only one level? There's different levels. And then you go to essential plus, uh, but there's, yeah, there, there's one level and then there's different levels of certifications if you want your your, your certification to sell certify or you, you get a, a body to help you. And yes, and then, Quite often, the next step for organizations, especially in the UK, who do that, uh, the next steps then would probably be the, the ISO certification because ISO certification has that level of uh, recognition in the in the industry the market and is very useful when you trade trade with uh, in the supply chain. Of course, yeah, everyone's concerned about supply chain. Well, it's been there for twenty years, or something like that. So. Uh... It has the benefit of, of brand recognition, I should say. It has, it has. And obviously, it has uh, quite a few criticism. The ISO standards, you want know, to achieve the certification, it can create a little bit of extra work that you do not always want to have. There, there is obviously a level of documentation. Documentation forces you, I would say, to, to do the right things, yeah? Uh, the documentation is only one aspect of the effort of going through an ISO certification. Uh, it's it's needed. It's, it is needed, and it's it's only every three years. Yeah, and it's uh, you you do not have to, <laughs> yeah, to do every all the documentation every three years. You need to keep your controls in order, of course, uh, and keep them up to date on a, on a daily basis. But the documentation aspect is not maybe so so as heavy as some some would like to to, to think. So if I'm having uh, the ISO certification. But as I said, it's a lot of process documentation and process is important because it delivers the control. So that makes sense. But now I, I want to do better on the controls because it's a little bit more limited and uh, I want to go a bit uh, deeper. Do I branch off then to ISO 27002 or should I consider the CIS controls? Is there any... Any, do you have any view on that? Yeah, I mean, again, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is, which is very important, is this thing about risk as well. Yeah, this thing about risk, and and again, without you know trying to be, I know what uh, some would think. You know, you're in a small business, you do not have time to have risk registers and and lots of coloring, uh, lots of fancy colors, red, amber, greens. Uh, but you do need to do uh, a little bit of it. You do need to, it's, it's, it's fairly obvious. Yeah? The, the, the risk is sometimes in your mind already. Yeah? As, a, as a, <clears throat> if you have your so small business, you know what you're more worried about. You're probably less worried uh, as a small business about a North Korean hacker than your accidental employees or your, your, you know, your highly privileged employees. So you need to do a little bit of that. Yeah? And you need to do a bit of that. So if you're yeah. very uh, tech, type uh, company, you might not want to go too deep into ISO. You might want yeah, to look more at uh, things like CIS or, or even, mm -hmm. though I haven't mentioned yet, the, uh, the CSA, the Cloud Security Alliance, yeah, publishes a control, a list of controls that are primarily for the, the cloud. Uh, so if you're a cloud-only uh, organization, again, that, that's, that's great. You can look at this uh, framework. It's uh, 200 controls. So 
as you can see, we're little, slowly but surely we're, we're, we're moving on to, uh, to longer little controls there, yeah? But there, there'll be more what we call industry technical controls, even though I'm not always a fan of this word. But yeah, there, there'll be a little bit more to the point of uh, how to you know, configure your uh, your APIs, how to secure your APIs, your, your development and, and your developers. And, and so, <clears throat> so, yeah, maybe look at slightly different uh, framework that when you are this you want to go to the next level. Any opinion on about ISO 2702? Is that, is that equivalent to some of the CIS controls or would you recommend uh, CIS control being a bit more updated, a bit more sophisticated? Okay, it's different really. So the ISO 2702 really are the ones to help you to do the certification yeah, for the ISO certification. You cannot have to do that. They are developed with uh, a lot of experts. We join the experts as well, so without wanting to uh, set my foot in the <laughs> in the wrong place, I, I think that they you know they are there for for a good purpose. The the ISO 2072 controls they are slightly different, differently worded than uh, <clears throat> something like CIS or CSA. Eventually, they all align, yeah, and and that that's part of the work that I'm involved as well in is doing some some cross references, cross mapping, uh, so it it can be also a matter of prefer personal preferences if you prefer to read an, a more American type uh, standard because CIS of course is American, um, ISO is international but with a more European uh, UK type flavor, probably a little bit more wordy in the, in the, in the word of ISO than, than CIS, a little bit more to the point. But, but again, it's not always true to say that. If you, go into, if you open up the CIS manual, it says 18 controls, seems fine, quite, it's, it's easy, I understand that. But you open the manual and then, again, you, you'll find lots of details, yeah? So it's a little bit hard for me to say with which one I prefer, which one I would recommend. I mean, I think to some extent is as, you know, as long as they update it, you know, because things change so much, as long as there's an update cycle. Yeah, so ISO obviously is updated. I mean, CS is the same. ISO has been uh, going through a major update yeah, last year, in 722. Uh, and probably will not be updated for, for another couple of years. So then you have more industry type standards. So, uh, I do have to mention a little bit the one that like we produce, the one that we work on. Uh, this one is updated every two years, yeah, the ISF uh, standard good practice. So then when you look at um, some more industry or, or more kind of closed type framework, all framework is closed to the membership. Yeah? So you have to join the membership and then you can access the framework because we put a lot of IP in, into it, a lot of work. Uh, so then again, that, that's for when you're at the next level, of course, yeah? When you want to, to go a bit deeper, you want something that's more regularly updated, uh, then you can look at these sort of bodies like, like us that will give you... Uh, CIS is not necessarily updated more frequently than ISO. Really. It, it is, there's no set rules, there's no rules set in stone, yeah? So I think then, uh, you know, I have now moved up and I have now a lot more controls, yeah? There are some people then who say, okay, you know, you keep uh, understanding or structure to the whole thing. You know, uh, some people like to structure their controls by using, uh, uh, for example, the, uh, the NIST site, uh, the way to uh, structure things. Uh, sometimes uh, I have seen people who have structured their control by organizing them along the, the kill chain. Uh, that is, uh, you know, one is there are different ways. I mean, and, uh, and I think they have the advantage of grouping and making, uh, giving a position to the different controls and uh, gives them a, a logical uh, a reason to exist and, uh, rather than having just a long list of things. Both, both uh, help, especially when you have to deal with many people, a big organization, big IT, or even a senior management. You want to understand what, where, which control go in what box and, and what, what, what they're for. Uh, any, any views or, or, or from your side, is any, uh, do you have any preference between more the uh, NIST side to structure the controls or you prefer the kill chain uh, side? Uh, That's right, because I'm just into this uh, dilemma at the moment. We're trying to restructure all on framework. And the best we can come up with is a, is a structure that is flexible enough to go into different, to be seen in different different ways. 
uh, because there are, like you said, so many different uh, standards out there these days that each of these standards has its own structure. Yeah? <laughs> There's no, no doubt about it. Uh, so again, from the sort of user point of view and user point of view, it's a matter of personal preferences. I think also your your the stakeholders with whom you're dealing. You know, if you think your IT department understands one one system better than the other, then it makes sense. If you, you know, I had cases where I thought the management which with whom I was dealing with had a better understanding if I organized control uh, along the different stages of the kill chain. Uh, because then uh, they 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 understood okay this this controls that to do that this control is to control that this was very material in in some sense yeah uh, I think it's your own preference but also the what you think will do the job uh, when you have to uh, have a, a broader uh, range of stakeholders behind you or supporting you yeah I like it personally to be quite flat as flat as possible yeah I do think of controls as the sort of governance management level of controls, the your policy based controls and your more technical uh, controls. Yeah. And, and, and as a starting point, that does how I like to think about these things. I know that yeah, you can group these controls in terms of uh, so NIST, NIST CSF, yeah, it is uh, is very popular across as well or or members, yeah, and protect and, yeah. and, uh, <clears throat> and the, the, this kind of um, little cycle, yeah, identify, uh, protect. So that Again, I mean that that can um, be done with almost any framework out there, and, and we no, it's a it's a classification in some sense, an organizational model. I, I think it's important to to have the list as exhaustive as possible because you don't want to miss any big things, right? You want to touch as much as possible as well on things like governance and risk because they are really the starting point, the foundation. Uh, and and a lot of people want to bypass this and think it's, oh, it's too heavy. I can't do that. But it's so important. You need to yeah, set the tone from the top. You need to understand your broad risk picture, your broad risk exposure, and then you can uh, deploy the the necessary controls. And it's easier to understand which are the most important controls. Right? Well, I would like to uh, uh, focus a little bit of time uh, towards the end of this video to uh, recent uh, things like the uh, DORA regulation for financial services or the uh, NIS2 as a follower to NIS1 and the more focus to critical infrastructure and to uh, uh, important companies or important uh, services. Uh, uh, of course, one is a regulation, one is a directive already that uh, makes things a bit different. And maybe uh, you guys in the UK still remember what uh, these are EU things I mean. We do, we do. <laughs> especially me. I'm yeah, European. Yeah, so you're French, so you understand that. So uh, do you have any, uh, I mean, they obviously are, came have been in the work for a while. They are focused on incident response, a lot about third party, a lot supply chain. So you, you'll see that in some sense, many of the COVID related things suddenly, or the things related, even geopolitical things with Ukraine, uh, suddenly have a, give a context. Uh, to uh, these things, because these things are in some sense are focused on a few things where they want to make improvements. Yeah, there are many, the, the security is much wider than these standards, but, uh, and they imply a lot of things. Yeah? For example, DORA, you know, doesn't talk a lot about technical controls when you read that, uh, the, DORA, uh, the DORA documents, but then they at the end say, yeah, but we're going to do a, a technical testing, a red team exercise on your company. Then you have through the back door, you have all the uh, technical controls. Now you have to uh, get right to resist uh, the, the testing. The NIST 2 hopefully gives new life to NIST 1, which was, you know, didn't really have uh, so much success. Uh, so hopefully NIST 2 is a, a lot more popular, but both of them insist on quick incident reporting. I, that's a mechanism to make sure that you, you, you don't hide anything and everybody knows what's going on. They also put fines in place, which is, again, a way to get management attention uh, in, in some places. What, what do you think about these two, uh, uh, these two uh, things, so DORA and uh, NIST2? NIST2 and DORA are being talked about quite a lot extensively. We had some, uh, some conferences, I was sitting with a the, with the colleague presenting on, on these, and, and more, of course, and more, because from the EU side, the, they like to, to explain that there's it's not just about needs to endure. There's there's all up to twenty new regulations in, uh, in the making. 
<laughs> there's more coming. I, I just really try to explain that if you do things well, if you know you deploy your your controls, you you're confident, you've got risk management in place, you don't need so much effort, extra work, yeah, for for these two or, or, or for more. It's, it's about the fines, and that's obviously uh, can be worrying for, for some organizations if they haven't done the right things. Um, <clears throat> so there's a little bit of a firefighting effect, isn't there? It reminds me a little bit of pre-GDPR, uh, where I was working, uh, everyone was so worried, and then GDPR happened, and then not much happened. I mean, there has been big fines, there has been some big fines. The big fines came only a couple of years after. Um, so I think, yeah, I think you can only do the best you can. You can read, of course, you have to read uh, if you're impacted directly by this to or door, you have to read the directive to make sure that the act that you're, you're not missing any, any important element. But if you're using a, a good standard, like even like ours or, or like uh, an ISO 272 or, or NIST, uh, if you're doing it well, uh, there shouldn't be any, uh, any gaps really. I agree. There is nothing new in that sense. Yeah, I think it's only the emphasis has changed a bit. And I think the the other thing is, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I, I I feel we always have to remind people, yeah, uh, especially when you deal with regulations and so on. You know, sometimes uh, you, you know, many companies or entities which are subject to uh, the regulation are more afraid uh, about the regulator than they are afraid of hackers. Yeah. My general, uh, I understand where that comes from. My general personal thinking is always that you should think about hackers first. Yeah, what is it? What what you need to do to protect your company in its own way? You know, maybe it has become digitalized a bit more in the last few years, so you have more assets. Um, the the attack patterns has changed. Uh, the way your employees work has changed. The, the way they collaborate has changed. The number of third parties has changed. But you have to think, you know, how to protect these uh, aspects uh, from, uh, you know, a more more sophisticated hacker uh, community, or I should say, it's a cyber crime industry now. You know, ten years ago it was hackers and cyber criminals. Now we're facing an industry, and I think you, my my recommendation to most people has always been to think about, as we say in the U.S., the adversary. Who is the adversary, and, and how do you how do you keep them out? And as first. And then uh, be also compliant to a number of specific things in the regulation, which may be important to the regulator in, in some ways. But most of the things will be the same, but there may be a few formal things which are different. Yeah, you can suffer financially a lot more from a, a bad event happening from a hacker, yeah? or nation said, than from uh, the legislation we see. Yeah? Any, any recommendation uh, before we close this video from you? I think I've covered quite a lot, yeah. So, so don't be scared don't be afraid by this uh, myriad international standards pick the ones you like or you choose try to start small uh, and then when you're confident you can go all the way to the 5000 that i mentioned i'm working on <laughs> and uh, and we do have uh, organizations who work with us who, who seriously do it so uh Good for them, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think uh, I would like, you know, I think that we have uh, covered quite a lot and we have come to the end of the video. So I, I would like to thank you uh, clearly for having shared these deep insights because few people have the wits and the depths of your view. Uh, so, uh, and, and, you know, and uh, uh, want to make sense of what's happening for them today. So, you know, there are many more insights I think you can share to our community. So looking forward to other videos we can uh, make together and we will put the links to your previous video in, in, in the show notes. And I think also we should put the link to ISF uh, in, in the show notes so people who uh, can see what ISF as a think tank is doing and uh, possibly become a member of, uh, of, of ISF. So, uh, you know, I think that that would be helpful. So again, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.